Um, so yeah, I'm uh, Chris. I work at MPM. I'm a registry engineer, and I'm here to talk to you about uh, No Problem Meat Bag 2017. Um, I work on the registry, so I'll be describing this from the registry angle. So you might already be familiar with the story of the registry. Um, couch. That's that's it, right? Um, it started out as a uh, couch application um, back in 2009, I think. Uh, my entire job is actually uh, four lines of JavaScript that Michael wrote, um, I think, in like a day. Um, it's the entire ACL service. It turned into an entire like fleet of services. Um, we used to be all couch. Now we're a sectional. Um, it's kind of fuzzing the truth, but more usefully, uh, the registry is holographic. That is to say, it looks different from different angles. It's also very shiny, I think. I will cover, I will cover the uh, following angles. Installation, HTML for humans and robots. Um, publication and RESTful API. Um, this is in descending order of how much traffic they serve. Um, and they're kind of rel relative importance to the uh, registry team's mission. So first, installation. The uh, guiding principle, I will be quoting um, our CTO, Siege, um, CJ uh, Silverio, uh, many, many times throughout this. Um, but the one directive that we have above all else is that the spice must flow. You must not notice that we exist. Uh, when you NPM install something, you should be like, oh, did I get that from GitHub? Or, oh, it's just on my computer. Um, we, we shouldn't go down. You shouldn't notice that, um, like, we, we are serving your packages, really. I mean, unless you were like examine it and want to look at it. Um, our goals are to be fast, reliable, and secure. That is to say, uh, not a lot of latency, um, always up, and uh, always with the right stuff. Like, if you put a, a private package up there, uh, nobody else should see it unless you want them to. And whatever you put up there, uh, you should get back. You shouldn't get some other package. So we're going to go through diagrams. Exciting. Um, OmniGraffle is the best. Um, so I'm going to take you through the, uh, the course um, a package takes on install. So this is, say you're NPM installing Budo. Um, the very first thing that we do is we go get Budo from Fastly. And we say, hey, Fastly, um, slash Budo, what about it? Um, uh, I have an e-tag. It's, it's blah, 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 hex. Um, and Fastly says 304 not modified. And nine times out of 10, this is enough. Like your NPM um, has a cache, um, which I will get into a little bit later at the end of the presentation too. Um, just another note. Um, and this happens in about 50 to 75 milliseconds. This is like the optimal case. Um, Fastly, for uh, folks that are not familiar with it, is a um, CDN, Content de uh, Delivery Network. Uh, you configure them using Varnish configuration language. Um, so it's just Varnish, which is an HTTP caching layer that it happens to be globally distributed. You can tell it's global because I get quiet when I move it over here. Okay. So what happens if you didn't have an e-tag or the e-tag didn't miss or uh, match? Well, you go to one of uh, our Nginxes. Um, if it's Budo. Um, say you're on the East Coast, or like I was um, just a month ago, I was in Kansas, and I forgot that I was in Kansas, and I was debugging over here, and I was hitting over here, um, which was a very embarrassing thing for me to do. Um, you will go off to Nginx, and Nginx will look at flat files on disk and say, here's your doc.json. And serve it back, 100 to 200 milliseconds, very nice. Um, this also happens to be where we get our e-tags from, the uh, M time of the package JSON uh, on disk. We call them packuments internally, because they're a little bit more than the package JSON that you write. Um, thanks, Couch, for that. So what happens if you're installing a scoped package? This is where things get a little bit more interesting, because we can't do this purely at a Fastly Nginx level. We have to actually do some like checking to make sure that it's not a private scoped package. And so, instead of uh, being directed to an Nginx, um, our Varnish configuration language points us to the nearest front door service, which is a node service that 
has stood the test of time and will do so for at least a month or two more because we're replacing it with something called foyer. Um, because door-related puns. Um, it is the front door to the re registry. Um, so what front door does is it says, hey, NPM auth web service, go ask access cache for this user against this package, which hits Redis, and Redis says yes or no. And this is about 200 to 300 milliseconds. So it's still zippy, but um, not as fast as like, here's an e-tag, get it off of disk. So what happens if it's not an access cache? We, maybe it's a package that nobody has asked for in a while, or maybe it's the first time we're ever asking for it, or um, banana, whatever reason. It's just not there. Um, we go off to a thing called Synecdoche API, which I chose that name um, and drives a couple of my coworkers uh, up the wall um, because it's uh, fun to pronounce really fast. Synecdoche, which does two things. Um, it goes off to Payments API to see if the account is paid for. So it'll take just that at NPM and say, hey, Payments API, do they have an account? Have they paid for private packages? And it'll also go to user ACL2, which is the sequel to user ACL1. Um, it lives on the host name user ACL5 West. So user ACL2 on user ACL5, it's really fun. Um, both of these are backed by Postgres's, separate Postgres boxes. Um, this has all the uh, ACL data in the registry. This is the five lines that Michael wrote, uh, oh my god, eight years ago. My god, <laughs> it's the future. Um, I need my like Doc Brown coat and like glasses. Um, so we go out to the user DB and we say, hey, this package, is it private? And the user DB dutifully says yes or no. And we put the answer back in access cache so the next time somebody asks this question, we will answer it in 200 milliseconds instead of 300 to 600 milliseconds, which is kind of a hit. The next thing that we do, um, after either this comes back or that comes back, is so we go from our front door service in Node and we say, hey, flat files are great. Uh, Node is great at serving streams of flat files. Um, not as good as Nginx directly, obviously, but you know, not, not horrible. Um, so we make a direct request to Nginx and serve up a flat file with the uh, appropriate e tag and what have you. So 300 to 600 milliseconds. And then what happens? We go off and uh, the CLI looks at that doc.json and says, hey, there's a tarball. Um, I need that. And so we go all the way back and we do this stance again. And luckily it's already an access cache because we put it there earlier. Um, there is a slight modification to this that just came out that uh, one of my coworkers um, finished. It's called Corgi documents. So we had packuments before and now we have shorter packuments called Corgis. Um, and what those uh, do is they include some information that we previously had to unpack the tarball from the CLI to find out, like, do you have a shrink wrap? Um, and so they have to make fewer requests in that case and with less data. But the entire dance otherwise looks exactly the same. We, we work this specific magic by uh, switching on an accept header. So that's installing, um, something that should be completely transparent and happens like some absurdly large number of times every day uh, without us noticing. Um, the next thing that people do the most, uh, and robots do a lot apparently, HTML. Everybody loves it. Um, it's a little bit different from uh, how we actually install packages, obviously. Like there's a lot more metadata that people need when they uh, are look, like trying to decide whether to install something or not. So we had to uh, go out and get a lot more uh, sort of metric data about it. So what do we do? You ask for Lodash. I am legally required to uh, put Lodash in all examples. Uh, I'm not actually legally required to. It just, it's really a good package to use because it, it's got like a lot of stuff on the page. Um, and it's a cool package. Um, so we all go off to Fastly. Uh, we have a different uh, VCL for this. There is no geo affinity yet for this. So you're always going to the West Coast. So uh, apologies to all other regions right now. We're working on it. Um, we go off to the website. We trade uh, the cookie for a session, the session for a username, and go off to the races. 
We then go to the access cache, which you recall from before. Uh, we say, hey, this user in this package, do you have the information on it? We do that entire dance. Simultaneously, we go off to uh, a internal varnish that we have that's sitting in front of a service called store file, which will reappear later, um, which sits in itself in front of S3, and we say, hey, what's the readme? Um, so just the HTML that we've pre-rendered. We simultaneously go off to those flat files on disk that we saw before, and we grab the docjson, the pacumen. Um, right now we grab the full pacumen. We should be grabbing the core key, but it's eno time. We then go to Elasticsearch, so because we are collecting databases here, um, and we want database uno. Um, we go here and ask for all the dependents of the package. And finally, Redis comes into play again, and uh, we get the download counts, which is now actually populated. Um, we switched recently uh, from backing it with MySQL to backing it with Redis, uh, and things started moving a little bit faster, and now there's scoped download counts too. So if you're interested in those, you can now get those from the registry. It's actually a lot more helpful to visualize what's going on here. So here's the page. Uh, you might be familiar with this. Um, that's from Access Cache. That's the README, docjson, dependents. And the thing that I forgot to outline, because, sorry, I forgot, uh, is the downloads, which are right there. There's more. The website does a lot more things, but I won't talk about too much of it. Um, specifically, um, search is now served off of a completely different service. Um, it's actually backed by Next.js. We are experimenting with React, and uh, the next framework seemed like a really cool thing to try out there. Um, and luckily, it's kind of worked well. Um, it has not fallen over. It's doing good. Would recommend. Um, the reason that we power things with Synecdoche API is that you could slice off the payments half of Synecdoche API, and it's just a user ACL at that point. Um, Synecdoche, in this case, is uh, to use a term to refer to a, a part of a thing by the whole or a whole by the part of the thing. So like, Boston did really good at baseball today. It's like, well, not all of Boston. Their baseball team did well. Um, and uh, the reason I only uh, visit the package page here is that they get way more hits than anything else on the website by far. That green down there that is not this blue, that's people getting 404s trying to get to a package page. So the website pretty much does the package page. So the third most important thing that we do, um, and the question you might be asking yourself, but how data? Publication. And this kind of hits on an undertone of uh, like the registry at large. There's an undertone. It's going to come to the forefront. I will say it in a second. See if you can guess it. I'm going to quote CJ instead. Um, data at rest must match the uh, access pattern. So the way you ask for data should, there shouldn't be any indirections there as like you shouldn't have to do a look up in a database. It should be, if you know the key, you should just be able to get to the data. And so all the services that we've seen thus far have been fetching things from flat files on Nginx by file name essentially. Uh, or out of access cache in Redis by username and package, so well-known keys that just directly index data out. But the trick is that you have to get it there first. Like you have to put the data in into the form where it's at rest in an accessible pattern. So we're going to walk a publish. Uh, you publish Lodash. Um, you wake up and you are JDD and you publish it. Um, it again, goes through Fastly, and Fastly says, this is a publish, I am not going to touch this, aside from to direct it to the closest uh, front door. Um, we only have two for this. You either publish to US West or US East. You don't publish to any place else. Um, for a reading thing, things like scoped packages, you can read from like Sydney or EU, but in this case, we, we just have the two. For now. So. You go off, uh, US East does the off WS dance. It says, hey, do I have the thing in access cache? This is all the things that you've seen before. They've just been helpfully rearranged out to the side to give me more space. We 
we get the default maintainers next. So we say, okay, there should be a package here. We're creating a package. Possibly we're making an entirely new like Lodash 5 or something or Lodash Neo, something like that. Uh, what, what people should have access to it. Um, as a kind of um, quirk of history, as a side effect of authorization, you are creating a package in the user database. Congratulations. Um, it's a put, so it, it works out. But uh, that too will change. Um, we then throw the default maintainers into the document and we throw the document and tarball at a thing called validate and store, which is actually the guts of the registry cow chap that we've just sort of melon balled out into a different service. Um, so the original couch apps uh, validation logic lives on plus some things that we learned along the way like long package names or uh, billions of dependencies uh, uh, limiting the number that you can depend on. I won't tell you the number because we'll try to reach it. Um, but there is a number. Um, we then SCP the tarball over to those flat files and put the doc.json into couch. So we are still couch at our core, like deep down, couch still powers the registry. Um, we have built a small fleet of TIE fighters and star destroyers around our Death Star 2 um, and an end to our shield base, but there's still a power core at the center and that power core is couch. But the story doesn't really end there because we don't read from couch. We, we, we have completely eliminated that from the read paths. As you saw, like we read from Nginx. Uh, or we read from Access Cache or the Elasticsearch uh, or any number of other places. So we actually have couch followers, um, just like you can write on your own now. Um, there's a thing called uh, registry dash follower and uh, concurrent registry follower, I believe. Um, so you can write these yourselves. The same sort of functionality that we're doing internally to power everything we're doing, uh, you can write. Um, there's a public uh, couch TV that you can follow and get all this information. So, the five most important followers that we have are the skimdb to public. So this is us putting only the public packages out onto that public followable registry. Uh, constructor IO to power the uh, type ahead search on the website. Uh, our capsule uh, service which takes the full packument and instead of making a corgi makes an even corgi or cor corgi uh, with just the name, description and number of stars. Um, registry Relational, which actually populates another database that I didn't get into because we're phasing it out, but it's a fully relational form of all the data in the uh, registry. It turns out that writing to Postgres in that fashion is not maintainable, um, so we are moving away from it. And finally, uh, CouchDB to store file. Um, this writes to that mysterious store file service that I was alluding to earlier. And it exposes an API where you can say, put a path with a blob, and what it will do is it will say, take the hash of that data, like git, and throw it into S3 by that hash. And it will throw into a store file CouchDB that's itself followable, um, the file name associated with the hash. We really wanted a queue here. We're moving to a queue. Um, but for now, it's a couch. So, the steps we take at this point are that we notice, we have a follower that notices that package index.json changed. We split out all of the individual versions from that. So like uh, there's a versions key in it with a million versions. If you've ever typed npm info, you can see them there. Um, and for each one of those, we, pre we put an index.json back into store file at that path. We then have another thing that notices that that path changed. And it, what it does then is it tries to grab the uh, tarball from the version out of the flat files on Nginx. It will then put that back into store file and something else will notice it. And then we'll explode that out, not fully. Um, there's a certain whitelist of files that we accept from it. And other things can notice the individual files changed. And we say, okay, we can just build a, a chain of this queue here. Um, what we do when the, we see a readme come through, uh, we actually render it using something called marquee markdown. Um, and we put back the uh, HTML in that form. There's another follower that does uh, following these uh, version documents and says, okay, uh, what are the uh, dependence graph? And then puts that into Elasticsearch. Um, there's another one that does the Corgi documents. There's all sorts of these followers hanging off this store file. 
um, which we're kind of uh, reworking for V2 to be backed by uh, NSQ instead of uh, CouchDB. Uh, use the right tool for the job. And so you can see there's this kind of mesh of like interconnections here. And this is, again, my promise that this will change soon. I probably could have just applied this to the entire presentation because it is um, ever changing. The last bit that we do is the API. And this is probably the, the, the tiniest part of the presentation because it's like, whereas the other events are on the order of like, I think in the last two weeks we got something like 500 million downloads of packages. Um, I'm just, I think I remember that number. It might be more, it might be less. Um, these are like every hour or so somebody adds an owner to a package. These are the knobs and levers by which people control what's in the registry and who can see what. These are things like npm team add and these curl commands. Um, you can see the vestiges of uh, CouchDB in that TIE fighter uh, slash dash slash, we call that the TIE fighter, underscore view depended upon. And that will give you the like list of people that depend on this package. Uh, but it's actually backed by front door. So um, there you go. This is this pretty much just directly, directly talks to a front door and then talks back to a user ACL. Um, so there's not anything really super exciting going on there. Um, and as such, I haven't really diagrammed it out. And that brings us to the end of our slides. Um, the thing that I wanted to mention about the NPM cache is that that will be getting uh, better and faster and super smart in NPM 5, which is actually available as a, uh, a public beta right now. Um, it does, has a uh, content addressable cache um, and it's self-healing and it's super great and way, way faster. Um, we've been using it internally on the uh, NPM website, which has something like 200 dependencies and we went from like five minutes to install a fresh copy of it to a minute. So uh, definitely check it out. It's got all sorts of uh, like super shiny features. But yeah, um, do you have any questions? <coughs> Fada, question. Yeah, so for those of us who don't know Front Door and haven't used it, can you explain what it is as a server and why you're going to that from uh, NG Nix and what you know what what's it, what is it giving you over NG Nix? What it gives us over Nginx. Nginx is uh, really good at serving flat files off disk. So file name comes in, uh, it goes to the disk and says. Uh, hey, there's a path there that matches this uh, URL that came in. Uh, I'm going to open it up using like some uh, syscall magic to immediately blorp it out to the response. Um, I think it uses like send file two or something like that, um, so that the kernel is actually sending the file down. The downside is that this is um, this is a single function. Like if you can get away with a single function um, where your data at rest matches the access pattern. Um, you can, you can say, okay, uh, Nginx is enough to serve our needs. In our case, at present, the front door has to have more logic than just path comes in, uh, give you back file from disk. It has to say, uh, hey, auth web service, do you have uh, this user in this package and are they public, can they access it, um, and then go through. Uh, in the future, what we will probably move to, um, I mentioned kind of in passing that we have a thing called, called uh, uh, Foyer. Uh, we will have two other services called uh, Spyhole and Deadbolt. Um, and what will happen is uh, when something comes into the uh, Fastly layer, the, the, the VCL will do a little dance and say, hey, they have an authorization header. We'll go off to the service called Spyhole, and Spyhole will trade that authorization header for a bearer header. It'll say, yes, this is that user. No, this is not that user. Like this token that you give us is valid or invalid. Um, and the backend service will just re receive a bearer at that point. Now in the case of uh, Foyer, it can immediately make any decisions it needs off of that. But it also enables us to do something kind of fun with like the uh, flat package reads. Because then they can actually be Nginx and the N Nginx auth module can just trade that bearer for a package visibility API using the Nginx auth module HTTP, uh, which I'm kind of guessing at the naming of, but it exists. It's a plugin that you can use in Nginx and it will say, uh, if you return a 401 from it, uh, the entire request will be invalidated. But it, it's a nice way of saying like, if you, the only extra logic you have on top of serving flat files from disk is authentication or authorization, you can hit this module instead um, and it will give you back 
uh, a yes or a no, and Nginx will continue or not continue as necessary. So that's what we'll sort of move to, more uh, fastly uh, VCL controlled uh, auth Z slash auth N phase. I had a question about uh, Yarn, and I was wondering if Yarn is a competing package manager or if it lives aside next to NPM. Oh, oh I know this. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll let Chris say it. Hello. Uh, so they are an alternate client. Um, so they are like IED or PMPM, um, uh, another way of accessing this registry. Um, Yarn actually fronts this registry with a, another uh, CDN, uh, like yarnpackage.com or something like that. Um, there are some upsides and downsides to that, like uh, all requests to yarnpackage.com actually end up hitting our US West servers, so no matter where you are, you don't get, um, like, for example, if you were to hit the uh, main registry in Europe, you would go to uh, a Europe, European-based um, Nginx with flat files on it. Uh, but if you're hitting like yarnpackage.com, you'll be hitting like uh, US West. So Oregon, actually. Uh, it's great for us because the data center is like just up the river that way. Um, but yeah, uh, they, they are an alternate CLI, not a completely different registry. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chris.